Yes, um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, so actually my, my talk was uh, uh, planned to be more practical, not theoretical. So, <laughs> so this is not about like a general, uh, I don't know, cross compiler between NumPy and Flink, but this is more about like if you come from a, from a Python NumPy background and you want to implement your data analysis stuff on Flink, so this is like I think the first few lessons you have to learn. Ah, okay. So this is right. So this is how you're more or less uh, used to program like the normal procedural style. So let's say a very simple example: computing a sum, right? So you have a variable which you set to zero, and then you go through all your elements and you sum up the the elements, and then you return the sum, right? So you have. <clears throat> so this is so natural that you're sort of your. Most of you probably are not aware anymore of, of what actually the building blocks are which you're using. Right? So you have variables and you have a bit of contro control flow like loops and ifs. And you can also do uh, function calls as a basic piece of abstraction. Right? And so this is like the minimal kind of procedural language thing. And from there you can just um, write all kinds of stuff. Okay? And that's also... Um, so when it, when it comes to data analysis, right, often what you implement is actually some piece of uh, linear algebra which is written down. So for example, let's say you want to center your data. So the, the xi are uh, vectors. And then the first thing you would compute is the, the mean of the data. So you sum them up and divide by the number of elements. And then you replace each of the elements by that vector minus the mean, right? So this is very simple. And usually what the first thing that you learn is sort of translating these things into code so these sums actually become for loop as, as we had before and then this um, replacement for like each element the i vector gets replaced by something else again would be a for loop like this and then you return the uh, the result right or, or if you know now a bit of numpy so one thing you learn very early on is you should not use for loops so and there's you see so if you pack everything into a matrix, then there's just a, a mean function, and you can tell it whether it, it does the mean like in this direction or the other direction. Right. right. So usually you take your data, and you put the, uh, let's say the data points become rows in your matrix, and then you can either do like in this direction, for example, if you want to normalize the length of the vectors, you can do the sum in this direction or the sum in this direction, and like a lot of the um, like the training or the things you have to learn is actually how to not write for loops but break everything down to matrix computations so that uh, this stuff becomes fast. Okay? Yeah. And so even if you have something like, so what you also learn is if you have something like least square regression where, so it's like a linear model for a prediction and the uh, the weight vector which you had, which you need for the predictions can be written like this, right? So the axes again are the matrices where the data is in the in the in the rows, and the y is a vector where the the labels are in. And then do you think there's a linear dependency between x and y? And this is like uh, okay, there's an actually there's an inverse missing here. So this is what you need to do, right? And then it's also pretty straightforward from here to go down to this. So right, so you take take each part of the uh, expression up here. So this x transpose dot, so dot is like the, the matrix, matrix multiplication x plus lambda times and this pl from pi lab, right? The uh, i is the identity matrix. And then you construct the right hand side, this x transpose y. And then you call um, this uh, function which solves the linear equation and then right, you get the result. So it's uh, so even even if you haven't done this, but you can see like it's a very so the way you, usually these algorithms are written, like in mathematics, has a very simple translation into something like like a Python based in NumPy, right? So it's pretty straightforward. So even if you have a more complex algorithm, more usually you can just do like a line by line, and then you have to take a bit care that you you don't have too many for loops and so on. So that's all. It's good. Okay. Yeah. So this is what I call like the basic procedural programming paradigm, like really like 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 C or Pascal, or in MATLAB. So you have some variables, and um, the other basic 
like data structure that you have are these ordered arrays and some functions which you can uh, with which you can work on those. So the advantage of that is it's very familiar. It looks very much like like the mathematics you try to implement, and of course the disadvantage is that it's hard to scale. So it's 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 uh, somewhat easy to make it fast on a single machine, but if you have all these matrix optimizations, because then you can go from Python to C code, and even I don't know put it on the GPU or something. But if you if you have something like like for loops, right? It's it's really not that clear. Like you can, it's, it's hard to go from this to something which can automatically scale to uh, large amounts of data. Okay. So um, yeah, so the solution that sort of the people have come up with and. Uh, like the Flink system is also uh, an implementation of that is this parallel data flow. So I think it's called parallel data flow, right? So I'm more machine learner in my background. So I'm just calling it, is it more or less? Yeah, okay, okay. So the basic idea is you often you have stuff, stuff like this. So you iterate over some set and then you map each element here to another element here, right? So if the, if the, if the for loops all look like this, then this is something which is actually very easy to scale because all the computations for different i, they don't depend on, depend on one another, okay? So right, so one set and then you map it to another set, right? So if you look back actually, oh, oh. Like here in the sum, okay, so sum is a bit different. So the sum, it's not, they're not really independent because, like, because you have this variable here which you keep, keep updating. But here, um, actually in order to uh, update the means, uh, to, to center all the data points you have, but this, this, could, this is something you could in principle do just do in parallel. Nah, nah, nah. Okay, so then, so, so, so what people have come up with, so to say, is they said, okay, let's let's go, let's switch from this more procedural type of programming to something to something different, right? So you you have, don't have, and you go from variables, uh, control flow, and what was the other thing, functions, to a new paradigm where the basic building block is an unordered set, and then you have a number of operations on these sets. Uh, and, and all of these operations are inherently parallel, okay? So it always looks like this, so you have some data set and some operation, and then what you can pass on is some function which sort of takes one element at a time and maps that to a new element. So the basic thing you already talked about is this map, right? So you take like a set and then you do something uh, to each of the elements, and then you get a new set which has the same number of elements, but uh, it's, it's transformed. But if you have something like this, then the system can just decide whether it does it like on one machine or on many machines. And the, the um, um, restriction that the set is unordered basically, right, also means you have more freedom in which you can do it. It's not like you really have to do it one by one, but you can just distribute it in any way you want. So other kind of operations, for example, are filter operations. So you start with one set, and then the function which you put in here takes one element at a time and then sort of computes um, uh, like a Boolean expression on those, so it says either it's true or false. Right? And that way you get a new set which only contains the elements for which this was true. So with this, for example, you can have like a simple kind of search. You take like each document and you test whether the word is in the document and then you get the documents which match the word. And there's more complicated stuff. Uh, one is this reduce idea. So for example, when you compute, want to compute the sum, right? the problem was that you sort of have this global variable which you have to update all the time. But now the interesting thing about the sum is that you sort of, that this operation, um, so you can take sums of parts of the stuff and then combine them later on, right? So you can sort of first add these two elements and then you get new elements and you can break this down. And that's also something you can again distribute. So for some operations where it's always, the operation is like you take two parts, you compute something new, right? Uh, that's called a reduce operation. And that's also something which people found, okay, if we have this, we can parallelize it very easily, but you can also do stuff. And then like the most complex kind of operation uh, is this where sort of your set, so now the set doesn't go from left to right, but from, from top to down. Um, so the set is not just elements, but actually it's key value pairs. So you have, so this is some ID, and then there's another set of IDs, and here are, so actually this should be different colors. So this is yellow and this is a slight green, okay? <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah, not, not even for non-colorblind, it's actually 
Yeah. Anyway, okay. Right. So the idea is you have to have keys which are like in the live in a common space, and then you have some other values. And now what you want to do is you want to find the matching elements from this space and from this space, and then put them together. Right. And this is again something sort of which which is called a join operation. Right. And so so in a way, like people so started working with this kind of thing, and then they found out that these are the basic operations. So there's a bit more like grouping and stuff. But essentially, so this is like what you have. So we've taken everything away from you. So no no variables, no control flow, and this is like the new paradigm which which you have to work. And so the only thing like where you have like the normal kind of coding is is here within these functions. So here, of course, you still have like normal ifs and and whatever. Okay. So um, let's try to compute some stuff using this kind of style. So for example, if you want to compute the sum, what you basically do is you do a, a reduce operation on the set, right? So you take two elements and then you return the sum of these two. And then if you apply this recursively to all elements, what you end up with is the sum of them. You can also compute the mean. Now this looks a bit uh, more complicated. So what you first do is you, you map each element to a pair which consists of the element and uh, the value one, okay? And then you do a reduce, which is similar to this. So again, you compute the sum, but you are sort of doing it independently on the on the elements you want to compute the mean of, and on these counts, right? So this is like in, in Scala rotation. So if this is a pair, then this is like the, the first element, and this is the second element. So I get two elements again. And I, so first I pick out the left part of these tuples, of these pairs, and then I add them up, and then I pick the second part up, and then I add them up. Okay, so what I get in the end is like a pair where I have uh, the sum of all elements and the number of elements. And then again I can, and so in the final step, so after this I have just an element which has uh, a set which has only one element. And then the final step I take that element and then I divide the, the sum by the number of elements, and then I get the mean. Okay? So it looks very different from what we had before. So this was sort of the, uh, the okay, so this part up to here, without the centering, of course. But, but still, it's sort of, I think if you sort of get used to it, it still looks quite natural, and then maybe you can write the function which so that you don't have to do this stuff again and again. Okay. Yeah, so we already heard about Apache Flink. So it's basically this thing which I called unordered set. It's called a data set in Flink. Um, and the interesting thing is here, so when you when you have an expression like this, actually what it does is it takes each, so it has a number of, um, of nodes which do some kind of computation. And what it does is it takes those and puts like, so it instantiates all these nodes in parallel and then it streams the whole data through. So it's not that actually, so it's not like uh, all the XS are first mapped to this and then they're reduced and then they're mapped again, but it's actually it's like all of these stages are happening at the same time as the data is piped through, right? So. So first you have like, so this is sort of says how many elements you have here. So first you map it to this, then you reduce it, and then you only have one element, and then you do this X by C combination. So that's also the difference to, um, so in Spark it's really like you have these if you write it down like this. So Spark is very similar, but then it executes these things one after another. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a little bit of, so if you come from Python background, right, so if you're really like into, into data analysis, you have no exposure to any kind of Scala, Java, or uh, this kind of enterprise programming, this can be very intimidating. Um, so my recommendation would be that you use the Scala API. Uh, so somewhere on the pages from Flink, there's like a minimal um, a skeleton for a project with Maven. So, so when you want to use stuff like Scala, you always want to use a build tool which can manage its dependencies. <clears throat> because if you look at Flink, it has something like 50 dependencies and you don't want to install all of them. So, dependencies and they have 50 dependencies, so you end up with like. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then the other, so you can either do that or you can use a build tool like Gradle, which has a bit, so where the, the description of the dependencies is a bit um, more compact. So I also heavily recommend that they use an IDE, so don't try to do this in, uh, in, in G-Edit or something. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. 
so IntelliJ or Eclipse, you know, so I, I like IntelliJ more. There's a, a free edition of which, uh, which also has support for Scala. And then the first thing you always do is you ha always have to import all the stuff from this package. <laughs> this is also something many people forget in the beginning. Okay. So this is side, so now let's go back to centering and see how that works. So the first idea sort of would be that you, um, so you first compute the means, right? with this little piece of code we had just had. And then in the next step, you would just, you go over all your points and you map and you subtract the mean from all the points that you have, okay? So but actually this does not work. So this is uh, one of the things you, uh, you have to get used to. So the problem is the following. So you cannot nest these data set operations here, right? So you compute the mean. So, I mean, the result is only one vector, but because it's like in these data sets, what you get actually is a data set which has only one element, and that is the mean. And if you put this in here, right, in the computation, it, it will not have been evaluated. So it's still like saying, okay, this is like the end result of some computation I have, but you cannot actually access here. So you cannot actually do the, the computation. So no nested, right? So if you expand this here, it would look like you has an XS map. And then if you, if you substitute all this up here, it's like a nested qu query within, like this thing you want to do the map, you have another query in there and that's not possible. Right, so if you write it down in this note notation, which uh, I think is not official, so there's some, there's something uh, I read it. So it looks like, so here's your data. So part of the stuff streams up here and it computes the mean, and then another part tries to do this mapping, right? But you cannot get this inside here. Okay. Um, yeah, so even if it's just a single element, you always end up with a data set. So if you have some function which computes something on data sets, you always end up with a data set even if the result is only one element. Okay, so and there, there are two standard ways to do this, to, to uh, deal with this. So the first is that you sort of you do a cross product between the original set and this one element set which you had before. Right, so cross means in, in uh, so if you have two full sets, and cross mean means you get a set which has all possible combinations. But because here one set only has one element, you sort of you only get uh, you get a, you, you don't you just get the same number of elements, but you sort of copy uh, the mean which you've computed to all the elements in the original set. Right, so this would like, look like this. All right, and then you can do a map, and now this XM here will be a pair which contains like the data point and the mean. So right, so you sort of you compute this up here, then you do this uh, this cross join, and then what you have is actually all the data points and the mean here, and then you can do this computation, and then you get the centered data out. So this works, right? But in a way, it seems excessive because you're actually copying, or so sort of you're transmitting for each data point that you have, you're retransmitting the mean every time using this, and I'm, I'm not quite sure like like how optimized this actually is. It's, it's pretty optimized, probably, right? So. <laughs> okay, so the other thing, the, the other way to do this is uh, to use broadcast variables, right? So the original idea by broadcast variables is that sometimes um, you do a map operation and you need some side information, but you actually you don't want to copy that like into the data stream. So what you do is you can broadcast this information to all the uh, to all the workers. Uh, but now the interesting thing is in Flink is that actually this broadcast variable is again a data set, but within your worker node you can access the, it as a usual as a as a normal Java collection, right? So you so that way you can sort of trick yourself from having a data set which has a few number of elements into just really having the elements there, and then you can do the computation. So the way this works, actually, it's, it's right now it's a bit, uh, still a bit lot to, uh, a lot to type. So what you have to do is you have to sort of define. So this is okay. This is already more general. So this would be a function, which sort of uh, a class which takes a function, right? And then you can just do any kind of. So what the way this works is so you extend this rich map function. You have a, a value in here, which is the value of the broadcast variable. And then you have to override the open method. And in this open method, you sort of get the context. And then from there, you get the broadcast variable, which has a certain name. And you store it in B, uh, in, this, in this variable. And then down here, now when, it's, when, when map is called for each of the elements, right? you can do this. And 
No. So in this um, uh, machine learning part of Flink, we already have like a helper function which lets you do this without actually going through this. So you can just say map with broadcast variable, and then you pass in the broadcast variable, and then and then the function, and then the function get the stuff. But actually, the the information is only broadcast once, so that's a good thing. So in this uh, version, right, it's all the same, but now we actually have this uh, all the data points mapped with broadcast variable. So we, where before we had this uh, cross with tiny, right? And then, so the difference, so it looks very much like before, but the difference is that this mean only gets transmitted to each worker node once, and then you can do this. So this picture sort of, you compute the mean, you compute this, and then the, um, uh, you only transmit this as a broadcast variable once into here, and then you can do this. Right? And the nice thing about Flink is that you can have these different stages of the computation. Right? So in a way, this must be computed before you can, before you can compute this. But because of the streaming fashion, it's, it's okay. So everything is set up once, but then it only starts after like the first stage is finished. I think. Yeah. Okay. So in a way, so, so normally in this procedural stuff, because we have variables and functions, right, we always have this thing where we so compute some intermediate results, and then we start combining these results with some other data which we have, and so on. And this means, like, if you do something like that in Flink, you have to get used to just translating this into stuff where you, so it's okay if you compute this stuff, but then in order to access, uh, like, different data sets, and usually, I mean, usually I have some intermediate results which are just data sets with, with one element. What you have to do is, you have, the best way to do it is to, to broadcast the, the data into the computation and then you can combine these things. Right? So, and at first this is very, um, uh, it takes a bit to get used to, but then after a while I think it's actually quite, so I don't find it that difficult anymore. Okay, so the other thing is, um, now, like as, as I said before, so in the normal, so the, the two things we have had was uh, the three things we had was uh, variables, uh, control flow, and these ordered uh, collections, which you, we use to encode like matrices and vectors and everything. And now the problem here is if you want to go or the, the what's different about these data flow systems, as I said, is that these setups are unordered, right? So for example, in um, uh, if you if you know SciPy, so like a machine learning library in Python, uh, if you have a model and you want to fit it to some data, you just pass in like the inputs and the outputs, and both of these are um, uh, two different matrices or arrays which are not connected, but the the correspondence between input and output is clear because like there's an ordering, right? So the first input corresponds to the first output, and so on. And now, the, the, so in Flink you cannot do this, so instead what you have to do is you sort of have to have pairs of inputs and outputs and then you create a data set based on that. And then when you want to call the fit, you just pass in all these two things, right? So you have to go from, um, from always thinking about, okay, I have like these different sets, uh, but I know like which what belongs to what because they're ordered. You have to go to a setting where you sort of make sure that um, all the elements which belong together are grouped together and then you can have a data set over that and then in principle you can do the same kind of computations. Um, yeah. So if you want to do vector operations here, so what you can do, for example, is that um, if you if you have to have a vector like this which is ordered, then you have to map it to a set which looks like this. So a key value set where the, the key is just the index of the element. Um, and then, for example, if you want to do addition with that, it gets a bit uh, complicated, right? So you, the first thing you have to do is you have to join A and B based on uh, that the index is the same, right? So in the join, what you have is, um, okay, so these are like pairs of pairs. <laughs> So this is like the from the first part, from the second part, and the index is always the same, but the value is different. Right? And then if you want to do the addition, what it is that you take the index from the first one, so from the first, from the left pair, the first index, and then you take the values, which is like the second value for the left and the right pair, and then you add them up, and then you can do that. Okay? So I haven't benchmarked that, but my, I'm not sure whether this is really that fast, uh, but luckily, so it turns out that very often um, 
uh, you actually don't have to do that. So for example, when we come back to um, num, 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 to this, uh, where is it? <laughs> to least square regression, okay? So as before, like the, the, we have to compute two, two things essentially. So the first is we have to compute this uh, x transpose x, and the other thing is you have to compute this x transpose y. So this is a matrix vector multiplication, matrix matrix multiplication. Right, and now the, the, like the naive thing would be that you encode these with explicit indices, and when you want to do the multiplication, you first do the join and so on. But if you look at it, you see that actually you can write pop up, up right here. So this, right, is actually you can write it as a sum over some computation on the individ individual vectors. Right, so xi, xi transpose, this is like a, like a full matrix, and then when you add all these matrices up, what you get in the end is the x transpose x. And likewise here on this side, right, so there are different ways to write it, but one way to write it is actually, you, so you take the ith label, which is just a number, you multiply that with a vector, and then you sum everything up, uh, and, and everything is good, okay? And so in this case, actually, you can, um, what, what you have to do is just, just a map and then doing the sum as, as we always did before. And you don't have to do any, any kind of with the indices. So, so my tip would be whenever you try to implement something, right, so, so you have to learn to, to spot these things or to know, like, um, so if, if you do it the other way around, right, then it gets very messy. But if you do it this way around, it's okay because yeah, these elements, so it doesn't depend on the ordering and so on. And then actually the, the, like the code which you get for these square regression looks very much like Python. I think this is very nice, right? So first you, um, what you do is you compute this x transpose x, right? So you compute, so outer in this case would be the function which computes this kind of product, and then you sum it up. Uh, here you just multiply it, you sum it up, and then again, right? So these are intermediate results, but these are data sets which only have one element. But if we want to do it now, use it here, we actually have to um, uh, broadcast it into this. So what we do, we take the first data set, we broadcast the second data set in. Okay, maybe you could also cross the tiny or something. So we have to unpack it again, but then the, this is just like the, like in Scala breeze, uh, which is a matrix library, this would just be the way to solve this linear equation. Right, and then the result again, of course, is, uh, is the weight vector, but as a data set. Ah. Okay, so summary, right? So what we're all used to is this procedural stuff where basic building blocks are element-wise operations. Uh, oh, sorry, no, this, uh, okay, so the procedural stuff, okay, variables, uh, control flow functions. In data flow, we have these uh, element-wise operations on our set which cannot be nested. And uh, you have to combine these intermediate results via broadcast variables, right? So, but if you, once you get this, this trick, I think it's, uh, the rest gets much easier. There's more stuff. So Flink also has support for iterations, but very often you have stuff where uh, functions where you iterate. So this can also be modeled. And then one thing here, uh, which I sort of did not sell you. So if you type this into Flink, it wouldn't work because so in so type um, yeah so so who knows what implicits are in Scala. Okay. <laughs> okay, you should know. <laughs> okay, so the so in, in Scala, there's a way to if you have a function call to to pass in some side information, um, and like the the locations where you can get the side information from is very very flexible, right? So it's a bit like magic. It's almost like Ruby level magic. <laughs> And um, at Scala uses so type information a lot in order to know like to, to know how you know, types are serialized and all that. Um, and the, the problem, or yeah, is at least so if you have a function which works on data sets, then you so the compiler complains suddenly that you need all kinds of type information. So what you have to do is you have to sort of put a more few more implicits up here to. Um, yeah, it gives the compiler what it wants. So I, I don't. So I'm, I'm still very bad at spotting what exactly the compiler means. So I'm also doing it more or less trial and error, and just you know saying, okay, if you if you think you need this, I just add it as an implicit variable here, and then we see. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully this will make it a bit easier for you to get started and just start writing code as you would do in Python.
Thank you very much. <laughs> so any questions? Sets or bags? Hmm? Sets or bags? Are these multisets or are they real sets in the sense that there's no... Oh, well, multisets, yeah. yeah. That's right. I have one question about yes. the matrix multiplication. Can you go back yeah. Uh, yeah, to the code? What is the first and what is the second um, element of XY? What is the time of the. Sorry? What is the. What is the first. Oh, sorry, so the, the idea is again that, uh, uh, like here, so actually I'm getting you, I'm putting pairs of X and Y in there. Okay, and what, what okay. is X and Y of which time? So x is a vector, okay. and y is just a double. So okay. it's like a vector and double. Actually, so yeah. So to get this, I uh, just see. It. So to get this xs, you sort of project this to the first. So you do a map, and you just get the the vector out. Okay. But apart from that, it should be more or less correct. Okay. Thank you very much again. So now I think there's a break, and then Till will give his talk if he's ready. Yeah, like 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>